The subject of today's session is, in a way, a sequel to our last session on Genesis, in which we considered the subject of Isaac's blessings to his sons, to his heirs, true and false, and by implication, to the conflict between those two sons, Esau and Jacob. At this point, we're a little bit further in the narrative. We're up to Genesis chapters 32 and 33, and poised to consider an issue that far outlasts the lives of Jacob and Esau themselves. But the subject certainly has its origin in what we read in these chapters. Jacob and Esau, eternal conflict or resolution. Let's first return to the story of our principal protagonists, antagonists, Jacob and Esau, and consider where the story leads us and what lessons clearly it has to teach us. Beginning in Genesis chapter 32, in verse 4, we find Jacob on his way back home, back to the land of Israel. And the Torah reports to us, Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the field of Edom. And the message, in chapter 32, verse 5, he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you say unto my lord Esau, note the reverential address, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban, and delayed until now, and I have oxen, asses, flocks, men servants, maid servants, and I have sent it to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Well, in verse 7, the messengers return, and the report is, we came to your brother Esau, and moreover, he is going to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Now, it is indeed a tantalizing mystery that we're never actually told what Esau's intention was in bringing 400 men with him. But Jacob certainly fears the worst. In verse 8, Jacob was greatly afraid and was distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two camps. The logic of the division, verse 9, if Esau comes to the one camp and smites it, then the camp that is left will escape. Now, we can't help but note here, this is a desperate strategy. Jacob is a desperate man. If anything, if one sought to defend oneself against an enemy, in unity, there is strength. Well, in unity, there is strength, but to vary the metaphor, if you put all of your eggs in one basket and the basket falls, you lose all the eggs. Jacob fears here that his prospects for being able to save everyone, everything he has, are so low that he's better off dividing the camp in the hope that at least one of the components, one of the halves, will be able to survive. This is Jacob's initial reaction to the report that Esau is on the way. His second reaction is prayer. Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord, who said to me, Return unto your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I am not worthy of all your mercies, all the truth which you have shown unto your servant. Deliver me, 
I pray you, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and smite me, the mother with the children. And you said, I will surely do you good. Make your seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Prayer. And indeed, it is instructive to note that after he prays, he's not so desperate. The prayer, perhaps, gives him the confidence and the hope that he then launches into a third strategy. The third strategy, which we read from verse 14 and on, is to send a gift to Esau. In verse 14, he lodged there that night and took of that which he had with him, a present for Esau, his brother. And the present includes goats and camels and cattle and... He delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by itself, and said to the servants, pass over before me and put a space between drove and drove. And the message that he has each of these servants deliver to Esau, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, who are you? And where are you going? And whose are these before you? Then you shall say, they are your servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my Lord, even unto Esau. And behold, he is also behind us. And this he commands each of them to say, note again the reverential address. And he further instructs them to say, moreover, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face, perhaps, he will accept me. We skip to the beginning of chapter 33, continuation of chapter 32, the struggle with the angel we've discussed in previous cycles. The beginning of chapter 33, this nearing rendezvous comes to its climax. Verse 1, Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men. And he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel and unto the two handmaids. And he arrays his family. In verse 3, he himself passed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came to his brother. Note, the extent not only of appeasement, of debasement. He debases himself in attempting to assuage what he anticipates is the wrath, the fury of his brother. And in verse 4, Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. And what follow are a couple of illuminating exchanges between the two brothers reunited. What one certainly senses in the exchange is the theme of reconciliation. In chapter 33, verse 5, Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children and said, Who are these with you? And he, Jacob, said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. And then the wives and children all come and bow down before Esau. And in verse 8, the second exchange he, Esau, said, What did you mean by all this camp which I met? And he, Jacob, said, To find favor in the sight of my Lord. Whereupon, what follows is an interesting, subtle exchange that 
most of my, much to my frustration, I find that many translations seem to uh, confound. Esau said, now, no, the translation here renders it as I have enough, which is, with all due respect, wrong. The Hebrew states that Esau said, Yesh li rav, which means I have much, nothing about enough. I have much. My brother, let that which you have be yours. Jacob said, no, I pray you, if now I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present at my hand, for as much as I have seen your face as one sees the face of God, and you are pleased with me, take, I pray, my gift that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have, and here again, the mistranslation is, I have enough, which is not what Jacob says. He says, I have everything. So, of course, you know then the distinction between Esau saying, I have much, in the Hebrew, yes, li rav, and Jacob saying, I have everything, in Hebrew, yes, li chol. And it is Jacob who ultimately prevails, he urged him and he took it. And I think it is instructive for us to consider the contrast between these two expressions. This is a thought that is expressed in our classic commentators and enshrined in our ancient traditions. And I think it's an illuminating contrast between Jacob and Esau and the different types of personalities that we encounter to this day. When Esau says, again in the Hebrew, yesh li rab, I have much. I have much. But, you know, I could still have much more. Having much doesn't exclude the possibility of having more. When Jacob says, I have everything, of course, you realize you can't add to everything. Everything is all that could possibly be. When Jacob says, I have everything, what he is in effect saying is, everything I need, I have. Everything I don't have, I don't need. I have everything. So, of course, it should be clear to us when the contrast is between one party saying, I have much, like it's not much more, and the other party saying, I have everything. I'm finished. The one who will prevail upon the other to take the gift is the one who says, I have everything. The one who says, I have much, is still ready to take much more. Okay, this is an important point of note. I think we've mentioned it in the past as well. But in any case, we still certainly taste the taste of reconciliation, experience that motif. And indeed, in verse 12, Esau says, let us take our journey and let us go, and I will go alongside you. And despite this spirit of reconciliation, Jacob is more, shall we say, circumspect. He said to him, my Lord knows that the children are tender and the flocks and birds are giving suck, that is, they are nursing their young, and they are a care to me, and if they overdrive them one day, all the flocks will die. Let my Lord, I pray you, pass over before his servant, and I will journey on gently according to the pace of the cattle that are before me, and according to the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord to Seir. You go ahead. I'll catch up. Eventually. So in verse 15, Esau makes an alternative generous offer. Esau said, let me now live, leave with you some of the folk that are with me. And of course, again, I'm going to reiterate, we don't know what 
those 400 men were doing there in the first place. That is, were they really there merely as a welcoming committee, as the escorts whom Esau would commission to accompany his brother and family? Or prior to Jacob going to such great lengths to appease Esau and rescind Esau's wrath, he really did intend to do battle. In any case, this second offer, Jacob similarly refuses. He said, what need is there for this? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. It's okay. Leave me alone. And the end of the encounter in verse 16 is, so Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. Now, as for what Jacob had said, that I'll go according to the pace of the children until I come to my Lord to Seir, we read in the next verse, in verse 17, Jacob journeyed to Sukkot. He built a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkot. And of course, what is immediately glaring here is he wasn't going to see her. Which inevitably raises the question, how do we relate to Jacob's having said to Esau, you go ahead and I'll get there eventually. And of course, inevitably, that is part of the general question, the tension. What indeed is the emergent relationship between these two brothers? In order to better appreciate what the relationship is, in order better to understand Jacob and Esau, let's return for a moment to the beginning and briefly consider some of the ideas that emerged initially all the way back in Genesis chapter 25. Recall that when, after years of barrenness, because Isaac married Rebekah when Isaac was 40, Esau and Jacob were born when he was 60. When finally Rebekah conceives, we read in Genesis chapter 25, verse 22, the children struggled together within her. And in as much as this was not a normal pregnancy, she said, if it be so, wherefore do I live? And she went to inquire of God. And God said to her, by our tradition, God said to her, through Shem, who is, after all, still alive at this time, as indicated by simple arithmetic, and who was considered a man of God for the duration of his life. In any case, God said to her, through whatever means, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples will be separated from your bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder will serve the younger. Now, what followed after this prophetic description of the fate of the twin children who would be born to Rebecca is, of course, the story of their birth and the story of their growing up. We touched upon this in our last session as well. To review very briefly, the boys grew. Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a quiet, simple, single-minded 
man dwelling in tents. And then we read the story of the pottage, the lentils that Jacob was cooking. Esau comes from the field and says to Jacob, let me swallow some of this red redness. The color attracts his attention. And indeed, as a result, Esau is called. We could also translate the text as he, Esau, called his name Edom, red. So he asks for this red redness. And Jacob said, sell me first, as of this day, your birthright. And Esau says, I'm at the point of dying. What profit shall the birthright be to me? Jacob asks of him to swear, and he swore, and he sold his birthright to Jacob. And as we noted last time, lest we misconstrue this story to be a story of a wily younger brother outsmarting his somewhat obtuse older brother, we of course need to recall in verse 27, it is Esau who is the cunning hunter. Jacob is the one who is simple, single-minded. He doesn't know intrigues. Rather, it was simply a question of what is of value to each brother. And so in verse 34, Esau undoubtedly snickering that he had a great deal over here because he succeeded in getting some good lentil soup in exchange for a worthless birthright that didn't even make a difference to him. We read, Jacob gave Esau bread and a pottage of lentils. And he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. And the Torah adds, so Esau despised the birthright. This was not something that was of value to him. The birthright, presumably, pertaining to being the spiritual heir of his father, as opposed to the recipient of mere material possessions. Now, we skip to Genesis chapter 27, and of course this we discussed at length in our last session on Genesis, that, of course, as we all know, Isaac ends up being deceived into giving the initial blessing that had been intended for Esau to Jacob, tantalizingly, in verse 33, as we discussed. Isaac, after realizing that he was deceived, says, he shall be blessed. Perhaps I know he is blessed, referring to Jacob. Esau complains bitterly that Jacob has supplanted him these two times, having taken away both his birthright and his blessing. And he begs his father for another blessing. Whereupon Isaac says to him in verse 37, Behold, I've made him your Lord. All his brethren I have given to him for servants. So what can I do for you? No matter what I do, I know this blessing stuck. And it made him into the ruler and you into the subordinate. Remember, that is, whether Isaac was aware of it or not, the message that God had conveyed to Rebekah all those years earlier when she was bearing these two sons in her womb. When Esau still insists on getting a blessing, Isaac's message to him 
which also inevitably pertains to the interrelationship, the tension between Jacob and Esau. In verse 40, by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you shall break loose that you shall shake his yoke from off your neck. But that endures then as the context, the tension, how Jacob and Esau relate to one another, not merely as individuals at the time, but historically. Nations vying for supremacy in an unending competition. Now, we should note, we noted this last time as well, that Esau has, on a number of planes, already demonstrated that being the spiritual heir of Abraham and Isaac is not what is by any means uppermost in his mind. Indeed, before the whole story of the blessing, at the end of Genesis chapter 26, we read in verses 34 and 35, when Esau was 40 years old, he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Basmath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and they were a bitterness of spirit unto Isaac and unto Rebekah. A bitterness of spirit. Obviously, they were pagans. They were engaging in idolatry. They represented the antithesis of the spiritual legacy that Isaac and Rebecca had attempted to impress upon their children. That Esau is less than a paragon of righteousness becomes pretty clear at the end of the story of the blessing as well, where in verse 41 we read, and Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, let the days of mourning for my father be at hand, and I will slay my brother Jacob. This is all for a blessing. I'm going to make myself into a killer. And finally, as an additional example to illustrate this point, besides, of course, what we just saw, perhaps ambiguously, at the time of Jacob's return to the land of Israel, at the time of Jacob's departure, in Genesis chapter 28, when Isaac calls Jacob, blesses him, charges him, you shall not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. He sends him off to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. And in verse 3, he invokes God's blessings. God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you that you may be a congregation of peoples. And, verse 4, give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your seed with you, that you may inherit the land of your sojournings which God gave unto Abraham. As we discussed, here, and only here, Isaac invokes the blessing of Abraham. It wasn't part of the blessing that was given to Esau. It also wasn't part of the blessing that was given to Jacob thinking that it was Esau. The spiritual legacy was never intended to be part of that blessing. The spiritual legacy, which of course includes the land, the land of Israel, is only mentioned here after the first story of the blessing as the blessing that Isaac gives Jacob knowing it is Jacob the blessing that, evidently, Isaac had always intended, specifically, to give Jacob. What is most germane for our purposes at present is, number one, noting that, in essence, what Isaac does here is he further confirms, wittingly or unwittingly, the message that Rebecca had gotten so many years earlier with respect to the supremacy of the younger son. And additionally, what we also see here is Esau's conclusion 
from Isaac's charge to Jacob to not marry one of the indigenous ladies in the land of Canaan. And so, in verse 8, Esau saw that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. So, Esau went to Ishmael and took unto the wives that he had, Machalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nayot, to be his wife. But of course, he didn't get rid of the Canaanite wives who were a bitterness of spirit to Isaac and Rebekah. He just married an additional wife. Why that should solve the problem is anyone's guess. But of course, again, it does give us something of an indication of how Esau works, how his mind operates based upon superficial concerns. When he sees the lentil soup, he doesn't look at the contents. He just looks at the color. Give me this red redness. When he realizes that Isaac doesn't like the daughters of Canaan, he figures, okay, so I'll marry another, another wife in addition to them. Very superficial take, indeed, on what life has to offer. Perhaps the self-same attitude that motivated him to say, I have much, but I could still have much more. In continuing the story of Esau for the moment, in Genesis chapter 36, we read the generations of Esau, the same as Edom. And there's a description of his wives and children. And in particular, the first of the children of Esau mentioned mentioned in verse 4, Ada bore to Esau Eliphaz. This is especially significant when we consider what happens in verse 12, where we read that Timna was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bore to Eliphaz Amalek. We've discussed Amalek in the past. Certainly as a representative of the legacy of Esau, Amalek has a very special role to play in the history of Israel and ultimately the history of the world. In Exodus chapter 17, Just the very next chapter, after the story of the miraculous manna, and just two chapters, after the song of the sea, the song of thanksgiving after the miraculous splitting of the sea, we read in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. After all these miracles, Amalek is undeterred. Amalek is the first nation to attack Israel after the Exodus. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us out men and go fight with Amalek. And indeed, we read in verse 13 that Joshua weakened, broke the ranks of Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. But that's not the end of the story. Indeed, one could say there is no end to this story yet. Because we read in verses 14, 15, and 16. God said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it uh, the Nine Sea. And he said, the hand upon the throne of God. God will have a war with Amalek for all generations. Amalek, son of Eliphaz, grandson of Esau, the ultimate enemy of God. And as such, we note a critical additional dimension expressed in Deuteronomy chapter 25, 
Because after all, in Exodus chapter 17, who is doing battle with Amalek for all generations? It's God. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, we realize we are summoned to be God's junior partners. We read, again, Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17, 18, and 19. Remember what Amalek did to you, by the way, as you came forth out of Egypt? How he happened upon you, chanced upon you, by the way, and smote the hindmost of you. All that were enfeebled in your rear when you were faint and weary, and he feared not God. Therefore, it shall be when God your Lord has given you rest from all your enemies round about, in the land that God your Lord gives you for inheritance to possess it, that you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, you shall not forget. Note, in Exodus chapter 17, in verse 14, God says, I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Here, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 19, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Contradiction? Certainly not. On the contrary, this is a theme that we see repeatedly in the Bible. Ultimately, it's God's responsibility. God commits to blotting out the, mem the, the memory of Amalek. But, simultaneously, in his infinite compassion and grace, God enables us to become as it were, his junior partners. And he involves us then in this mission and tells us that we are to blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Now, when we consider where this leaves us with respect to Esau and his descendants generally, obviously this doesn't bode well. Amalek is slated for destruction, so it would appear from here. But it's important for us to appreciate, does that apply necessarily to the gamut of the descendants of Esau? Not at all. Indeed, two chapters before this excerpt, Deuteronomy chapter 25, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 23, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. And this pertains to the allowance that Edomites may become proselytes and become part of Israel. So the simple implication here is that while Amalek is indeed slated for destruction, that doesn't apply to Edom generally. Furthermore, we see in the Torah that Edom is indeed treated as a nation that is the brother of Israel. In Numbers chapter 20, Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom. Thus says your brother Israel. Do you know all the tra travel, travail that has befallen us, what happened in Egypt, and so on and so forth? And the solicitation, let us pass, I pray you, through your land. We won't pass through field or through vineyard. We won't drink the water of the wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed your border. And Edom says, no, you shall not pass through me lest I come out with a sword against you. And Israel attempts to persist. We will go up by the highway. If we drink any of your water, I and my cattle, we will give the price thereof. Let me only pass through on my feet. There is no hurt. And... Edom says, you shall not pass through. And Edom came out against Israel with much people and with a strong hand. Thus, Edom refused to give Israel passage to his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. So, of course, inevitably we realize that there are different motifs that emerge from this passage. On the one hand, Israel approaches Edom as brother. On the other hand, Edom clearly is not reciprocating. But the fact that we are bidden to relate to Edom as a brother, brother because of being descended from Esau, 
obviously says something about how we are to relate to Esau historically. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, we read this explicitly. God spoke to me, saying, You have compassed this mountain long enough, turn you northward and command the people, saying, You are to pass through the border of your brethren, the children of Esau, that dwell in Seir. And they will be afraid of you. Take good heed unto yourselves, therefore, and don't do anything to frighten them. Contend not with them, for I will not give you of their land, not so much as for the sole of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. So provisionally, just to summarize, we've seen the complexities of the relationship between Jacob and Esau, and what we're attempting to trace here is how these complexities and tensions play themselves out in the generations that follow. We have seen that on the one hand, Amalek symbolizes evil incarnate, the one who comes to challenge Israel immediately after the Exodus, the one who is doomed for ultimate extirpation. But that's Amalek. And then there's Edom, more generally, the seed of Esau. And with respect to Edom generally, again, we are specifically bidden, you shall not abhor an Edomite. For he is your brother. We'll note further that the attitude with respect to Edom and Amalek emerges in one additional passage in the Torah. And this is certainly one that should give us pause. It is, if you will, the first prophecy that we read with respect to the eventual fate of Esau, Edom, as well as Amalek, and this is in the final statement, the prophetic parable of Balaam. In Numbers chapter 24, now again, in the other sources that we've seen, Edom seems to emerge as a positive figure, as a brother to Israel, with the exception, again, of Amalek. Here, Balaam took up his parable and said, the saying of Balaam, the son of Be'or, and the saying of the man whose eye is opened, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. He will step forth a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall crush, smash the corners, or princes, of Moab, and dominate, uproot, all the sons of Seth. The sons of Seth, of course, constituting all of humanity. And we continue, verse 18, And Edom shall be destroyed. Seir also, even his enemies, shall be destroyed, while Israel does valiantly. And out of Jacob shall one have dominion, and shall destroy the remnant of the city. And he looked on Amalek. Remember, heretofore it was Edom. He looked on Amalek, and took up his parable, and said, Amalek was the first of the nations but his end will be everlasting destruction. So note, of course, that while we would expect nothing less than everlasting destruction for Amalek, here there's also the theme of Edom being destroyed, Seir, also referring to Esau being destroyed as well. That theme of destruction of Edom is one that occurs repeatedly in the prophets. We don't have time to consider all these passages at length, but I'd like to, at the very least, do a kind of flyover 
in considering these messages. In Isaiah, we encounter two prophecies that pertain to Edom. In chapter 34, verse 5, My sword has drunk its fill in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edom and upon the people of my ban to judgment. The sword of God is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For God has a sacrifice in Botsra, Botsra, capital of Edom, and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. God has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And again, in Isaiah chapter 63, at the beginning of the chapter, who is this that comes from Edom with crimson garments from Botsra? Again, remember, Botsra is the capital city. This that is splendid in his apparel, stately in the greatness of his power, I that speak with righteousness, mighty to save. God. And the question is asked, I guess rhetorically, wherefore is your apparel red and your garments like his that dread, that treads in the wine vat? And the prophet's response, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the peoples there was no man with me. Yea, I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my fury, and their lifeblood is dashed against my garments, and I have stained all my raiment. Again, with respect to whom? With respect to who is this that comes from Edom with crimson garments from Botsra? For the day of vengeance that was in my heart and my year of redemption are come. Again, note, very similar motif to the previous passage here in Isaiah chapter 34, where in the context of the battle with Edom, we also read in verse 8, for God has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. And that year of redemption coincides with the trotting down, the extirpation, of Edom. So at least it appears. Now, truth is that in Isaiah, we don't read explicitly why Edom is bearing the brunt of these very, very harsh prophecies. We don't see it entirely clearly, but at least we get something more of an indication in Isaiah's contemporary, Amos, who in chapter 1, verse 11, says, Thus says God, for three transgressions of Edom, yea, for four, I will not reverse it. Because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all compassion, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Teman, and it shall devour the palaces of Botsra. What Amos does clarify is that the punishment has something to do with pursuing his brother with a sword. What he does not clarify is what exactly are the circumstances of this pursuit to which he is referring. While Amos doesn't tell us, and maybe we really do need to leave that as a kind of enigma, when we consider the appearance of Edom, in Psalm 137, verse 7, the context is completely unambiguous. Remember, O Lord, against the children of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. That is, Jerusalem is under attack. Jerusalem is being destroyed. Who's there? Rooting for the destroyers. Edom. And indeed, undoubtedly, in much the same vein, in Lamentations, 
in bemoaning the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Israel. Chapter 4, verses 21 and 22. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwells in the land of Uts. The cup shall pass over unto you also. You're gloating now. You think everything is fine? The cup will pass over to you also. You shall be drunken and you shall make yourself naked. For the punishment of your iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. You already got your just desserts. He will no more carry you away into captivity, into exile. He will punish your iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will uncover your sins. So, we have a context. At the time of the destruction, the destruction of the first temple, the exile of Israel from its land, you would think, you would have thought that Edom and Judah would make common cause against the oppressors sweeping in. Edom sides with the enemy. Gratuitous hatred without even a reason. We might say classic anti Semitism. This theme of having sided with the enemy is one that undoubtedly informs, likewise, the prophecy of Edom in Jeremiah chapter 49, beginning in verse 7. Where the prophet begins, thus says the God of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? And in the continuation, I do bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I shall punish him. In verse 10, I have made Esau bare, I have uncovered his secret places. He shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, his brethren, his neighbors, and he is not. He's gone. And once again, the theme of the destruction of Botsra. Botsra shall become an astonishment, a reproach, a waste, a curse. All the cities thereof shall be perpetual wastes. And finally, verse 17, and Edom shall become an astonishment. Everyone that passes by it shall be established, uh, astonished and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. In tantalizingly similar terms to those of Jeremiah in chapter 49, we read in the prophecy of Ovadiah, which is all concerning Edom. The message, verse 2, Behold, I make you small among the nations, you are greatly despised. The willful sinfulness of your heart has beguiled you. You say in your arrogance, who shall bring me down to the ground? Though you make your nest as high as the eagle, and though you set it among the stars, I will bring you down from there, says God. And the exclamation in verse 6, How is Esau searched out? How are his hidden places sought out. A description of abject destruction and with the placement of the prophecy, Jeremiah, living through the circumstances of the destruction of Jerusalem, we can have little doubt that this is precisely what he's describing. Indeed, as we shall see in the continuation of the chapter shortly, this is Precisely the context of Jeremiah's words of stern rebuke. Besides the prophets that we have seen thus far, one of the prophets who perhaps at greatest length, and undoubtedly for the same reasons we've already noted, speaks of Edom is Ezekiel. Ezekiel living immediately in the wake of the destruction of Jerusalem, having witnessed what Edom perpetrated. In Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 12, because that Edom has dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and has greatly offended and revenged himself upon them, therefore 
Thus says God the Lord, I will stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it. And I will make it desolate from Teman even unto Tidan shall they fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. In Ezekiel chapter 32, once again, there is reference to the destruction of Edom. There's a list of many nations that, in context, are descending into hell. And in verse 29 we read, There is Edom, her kings and all her princes, who for all their might are laid with them that are slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with them that go down to the pit. Ezekiel returns to the subject of Edom once again in chapter 35. In verse 3, Behold, I am against you, O Mount Seir. Again, Seir and Edom, both pseudonyms for Esau. And I will stretch out my hand against you and will make you most desolate. I will lay your cities waste and you will be desolate and you will know that I am God. And here there is a specific nuance also emphasized with respect to the reason for such retribution. Because you said these two nations and these two countries will be mine and we will possess it. Remember, in the words of God to Rebecca, there are two nations in your womb. But Esau here is kind of reverting that because you said these two nations and these two countries will be mine. Everything subordinated to me. You will know that I, God, have heard all your blasphemies which you have spoken against the mountains of Israel. And verse 15, as you did rejoice over the inheritance of the house of Israel because it was desolate, so will I do unto you. You will be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Edom, even all of it, and they shall know that I am God. And one additional prophecy in the following chapter, in Ezekiel chapter 36. The reason I'm emphasizing this, on the one hand, chapter 36, verse 5, Therefore thus says God the Lord, Surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations and against all Edom, of all the nations. Edom is the one that's singled out. But in considering God's vengeance with respect to Edom, there's an additional theme. That theme is redemption. In verse 8, you, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people Israel, for they are at hand to come. This is one of the prophecies that most glaringly give us a sign. When the mountains of Israel shoot forth their branches and yield their fruit, it is a sign that my people Israel are at hand to come. that imminent redemption clearly here is linked to God's fury against Edom and the other nations. And indeed, that aspect of divine judgment and redemption is one that we encounter not only in Ezekiel. The very last words of the prophet Yoel, the end of the last chapter, beginning in verse 18, and shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of God, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Immediately afterward, next line, Egypt shall be a desolation, Edom, a desolate wilderness, for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah 
shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem from generation to generation. And I shall cleanse, avenge the blood, the blood that was spilled, or alternatively, we could read this, whatever I cleanse, their blood I shall not have avenged. And God dwells in Zion. The final righting of wrongs. The ultimate redemption is inextricably linked with God's judgment against the nations, and in particular with Edom. And he likewise, these were the final words of the prophet Noel in the first chapter of Malachi. We noted this in our last session as well. In verse 2, I have loved you, says God. Yet you say, where and have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says God. Yet I loved Jacob. But Esau I hated and made his mountains a desolation and gave his heritage to the jackals of the wilderness. Whereas Adam said, we are beaten down. We will return and build the waste places. Thus says the God of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall be called the border of wickedness and the people whom God execrates forever. And the very next verse, verse 5, and your people shall see and you shall say, God is great beyond the border of Israel. So, this ongoing message, redemption, retribution. Returning to the prophecy of Avadia, we kind of left it in the middle. After the prophet recounts the wickedness of Edom, we find much the same theme that was described in the previous passages. In verse 15, for the day of God is near upon all the nations as you have done. It shall be done to you. Your dealing shall return upon your own head. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. But in Mount Zion, there shall be those that escape and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire. And the house of Joseph a flame. And the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining in the house of Esau, for God has spoken. Which again, we could read as literally the obliteration of everyone coming from Esau. The destruction of Edom. I think it's important for us to appreciate that's not the whole story. The last verse in Ovadia, and saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be God's. Of course, inevitably, you realize if there's no one there, the kingdom isn't God's. But it's not about wiping out the people. It's about wiping out what Esau represents. Remember, we saw last time in the final verse of the prophet Micah, Micha, you will give truth to Jacob, kindness to Abraham. It's about the message. Jacob is charged with being the personification of truth. Jacob is charged with the mission of projecting that message to the world. That's the message of being with God. To whatever extent you're with the message, you're with God. And that applies to every single individual, including Esau, 
including every one of his descendants. It's significant to note that a theme that we saw in both Jeremiah chapter 49 and in Obadiah pertain to wisdom. In Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 7, of Edom, thus says the God of hosts, is wisdom no more in Teman? Is counsel perished from the prudent? Is their wisdom vanished? In Avadia chapter 1, verse 8, shall I not in that day, says God, destroy the wise men out of Edom and discernment out of the mountain of Esau? Now I feel compelled to share with you. Commenting on this verse, we have a statement in our tradition. If someone says to you, there exists wisdom among the nations of the world, believe it. It does. Because obviously, if God says, I shall destroy the wise men out of Edom, otherwise they were there. And likewise, again, in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 7, the rhetorical question is, wisdom no more in Teman means it was there. And the implication, inevitably, wisdom isn't something over which Israel has monopoly. On the contrary, we solicit wisdom from whoever has it for everyone who can contribute to projecting that wisdom in the world. When you do that, you're allying yourself with God's plan. Just consider in Psalm 60 and Psalm 108, we find almost the exact same expressions in verses 9 and 10. Gilad is mine, Menashe is mine, Ephraim also is the defense of my head, Judah is my scepter. These are, of course, all parts of Israel. Next verse, Moab is my watchpot. Upon Edom do I cast my shoe, Philistia cry aloud because of me. These are not Israel, but they also become subordinated to that goal of projecting God's message in the world. And so in verse 11, who will bring me into the fortified city? Who will lead me unto Edom? Not to obliterate it. Not to extirpate it. To rehabilitate it. It's all about choices. Every individual chooses. How am I going to heed or refuse to heed? God summons. All those prophecies of destruction indeed signify the destruction of Edom, the destruction of what Edom represents. But the individuals, they each need to decide whether what they represent is the moral bankruptcy of Edom. We mentioned these verses from Ezekiel chapter 32 describing how Edom is in hell with her kings and all her princes who for all their might are laid with them that are slain by the sword. And I feel compelled to share with you that even with respect to such a dire prophecy, her kings and all her princes, we have a tradition. Her kings, but not all the kings. All her princes, but not all the officers. Not everyone. Only those who follow the path of moral decadence, spiritual bankruptcy, that Edom became. Epitomized in Amalek, but even Amalek. Individuals born to Amalek can still redeem themselves if they accept upon themselves the Noahide covenant. They're not considered Amalek anymore. Now they're considered the 
faithful of the nations of the world. It's all about choices. It's all up to us. Indeed, on that note, returning to a point that we've already observed, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, you shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. The children of the third generation that are born unto them may enter into the assembly of God. Because it need not be eternal comfort. There is indeed the path of resolution, of returning to God and his blessings. God bless you.